Welcome to ESA Studio, your weekly hepatology broadcast news. In today's episode, we will speak about treatment decisions in liver cancer, in hepatocellular carcinoma. My name is Tom Lütte. I am from Düsseldorf in Germany, and I have three experts today in the faculty. I'm very happy that you're here today. I start with uh, Anna Zabarowski. She's from Hanover Medical School. Hi, Anna. Hey. Great you're with us. And then Thanks we have... for having me. Yes, great. And then we have Arndt Vogel. Um, hi, Arndt. You're here with us from Toronto in Canada. Hi, it's good to see you. Uh, thanks for having me. And indeed, I'm now in, in Toronto. Um, cold, no snow, blue skies. Sounds like skiing holidays. Right. <laughs> okay, great. And finally, with us is Christoph Roderburg. He is a professor of GR oncology also here in Düsseldorf. Hi, Christoph. Thanks that you support us today. Hi, Tom. Great. So um, it's kind of a tradition now that at the end of the year, we're, we're summing up a bit uh, uh, what's happening. But today, really, we want to speak practically about uh, what's uh, new and how we can, what we learned this year, how we keep, can build our decisions in liver cancer. Just very to start very briefly, Arndt, 20, 2023 is now coming to an end and you might agree it's not has not been a great year in terms of politics and so on many, many crises for liver cancer it's been a very dynamic year what was your highlights and i think mainly beyond the trials i think you there was one big highlight very recently in barcelona that you joined um in in barcelona you mean which yeah so the, the goodbye to one of our most important and famous oh, liver oh, cancer oh oh, oh, oh right right researchers. I mean, which is kind of also a highlight, of course. Um, yeah, but I think um, so. The last thing in Barcelona was basically the farewell symposium for for Jody Brute. Um, clearly, and the expert in the field, he um, introduced the BCLC group. He developed the first staging treatment algorithm, and um, I, I think he really had a tremendous influence on the way how we treat liver cancer today. And it was clearly a, actually also an emotional um, event. And um, it, it was uh, very impressive to see what he has really built over the last um, 30 years. So that was definitely an, a highlight. I think we, we will probably still um, be around for a while. And, and he has still, he's still involved in a lot of clinical trials. So that's um, good to know. But yeah, right. But it's also like an, an like an an area comes to an end, right? And now we have my Maria Rake in, in Barcelona and she's probably very well um suited to follow in into his position. Um and I think the Barcelona group will will remain a very important group for, for the treatment and diagnosis of liver cancer. And yeah. in general, I, I fully agree. I mean, we have seen a lot of progress in recent years. I mean, it was not just this year, but the last four or five years um, has really changed the options we have for, for the systemic treatment in liver cancer. And it's, I mean, we had so many years where we only had negative trials and we discussed why did trial A, B, C fail. Um, now we have a lot of positive trials. We have some negative trials and um, we, we can still discuss why they failed, but most of them have really active treatment and having now so, so many options for the advanced tumors, what we are now seeing is that the the, the treatments and specifically the IO-based treatments are moving to earlier stages, which is certainly interesting and which will, and I think we will discuss later on, but I think it's good to see now the first positive trials in the adjuvant setting. We had a positive note for, for Emerald in the intermediate stage, and, and this is something we definitely should discuss um, later in this program today. Perfect, and thank you very much. Um... Anna, Christoph, um, also to you the question, I mean, the, the progress is now so fast. Can you still go to all the meetings? I think it's getting more and more difficult to really keep up with all this great progress we had. I mean, 10 years ago, we had many negative trials. Now every three months, even at AACR, we had a very important clinical trial this year. Any... Uh, 
of, of course, I think it's getting it's getting increasingly hard to go to all the important meetings, um, but it's nevertheless important um, that we keep up with the new data mm. that's presented definitely and um, we can learn so much um, from the developments also in, in the recent years and I mean a little shout out to easel and maybe also some product placement here, but I think it's great that we have easel to really um, sum up the newest developments in these kind of events like tonight. Absolutely. I mean, I have even been on ACR this year. It was for me the first time being on this meeting in, in, in Orlando, basically. And I think there we have seen the first ever positive adjuvant treatment in the context of HCC. And I think, I mean, we can discuss whether the, the, the study was really positive or not, but it was really, for me, one of the highlights this year. Yeah, I think, I hope we can have some controversial discussion on that. And, you know, I'm really saying we don't have to be politically always correct in this round here. So let's discuss this. I was thinking, I mean, we're not a podcast. We have a live audience here and we're trying really to involve you and uh, to get a bit practical here. So can we have prepared a little, Paul, this is a little bit an experiment for this format here, but it maybe can provide the stage to discuss what we have right now. So I'm asking, can you please put the poll and for everybody who is online or who is watching us later, you can also comment in on this on the easel web page on this um, case. So if the poll is online, I uh, give you one second to the techniques. Um, I'm reading the case, a 65-year-old male patient presents with HCC, ECOG-1, underlying MASH cirrhosis, not NASH cirrhosis, MASH cirrhosis, <laughs> child QA. <Can> explain? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, I, I can say something to that later. <laughs> HCC with multiple B lobular lesions, six lesions smaller than four centimeter, no distant metastasis, suspected portal vein thrombosis, grade one esophageal varices, still in the, it says, controlled by ligation three weeks before therapy, which would be your first line treatment of choice? Answers would be lenvatinib, atebef, stride, dovamonu, or combination of local regional therapy plus Dovalumab. So I suggest we give the audience 20 seconds or half a minute to comment, and then I will ask this, and maybe um, you can summarize again a little bit what we have right now in the palliative setting and, and what could drive a decision. So uh, Lenva, Atibef, Stride, Dovamonu, local regional therapy, good liver function, MASH, cirrhosis, and probably low-grade portal hypertension. So why are you, um, well, we wait for the last votes and, and show them. I already asked Anna before what would be her choice. I know that, so I ask Arndt now. Arndt, what's your favorite choice? And can you reason a bit? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think it's an interesting case and probably something what we see uh, multiple times in the clinic. I, I would like to have some more information on the underlying liver cirrhosis. I understand that the patient has portal hypertension, so obviously he has more advanced cirrhosis, not only fibrosis, um, type UA um, in terms of IV, could be IV1, IV2. I mean, so maybe a little bit impaired liver function, but obviously... Um, um, portal hypertension. Then he has multiple lesions, um, which would make a supra selective taste challenging with over six lesions. So, therefore, local therapies alone, like taste or tear, even without seeing the pictures ju just by the numbers, I would consider local therapies not, not like my preferred choice. Um, he has also portal vein infiltration or suspected portal vein infiltration would be maybe, depending on where there's a contraindication against um, uh, TACE, Y90 could be an option. Um, for, for, for the systemic therapies, I think we, I mean, we, we would need to do some cross-trial comparison, um, of course, but I think we, at the moment, we would agree that if we do this cross-trial comparison, that Artesobev 
um, has a good package. It has high efficacy, it is very tolerate, tolerated, and we do have um, experience with that. Um, Stride Durvatremi, I think, is also an option. Um, it is recently approved, so we could consider it. And then Vatanib um, is definitely something we have used for a while. I personally do not see an argument here for this case why I would start with an TKI. I do not see um, striking contraindications against a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, but the, the very C's are treated. Um, so I think I would consider the bleeding risk for not so high. And I think the the very C is great. One hour would not be in contraindication for me for Atezobev. So I think Dova Mono, um, I, I do not see a reason why I would not use Stride. So I think the my preferred choices were Atezobev or um, Dova Tremor. So thank you, Ant. And we have the results here. Do you see it also, everybody? Yes. So let's repeat for the audience. Surprising and great for discussion. We have top on the top two treatments. We have, yeah, that ATBF now that aren't reasoned about it. <laughs> it's getting higher. But Lenva, even up and now second place, still every third member of the audience would give Lenva here. I think that's very interesting. And uh, on the third place, it would be Stride. 11% and even up with a combination of local regional therapy plus Dova Beva. Um, Christoph, would you have expected that? I wouldn't have expected Lenva being so strong, honestly. Maybe that's also a bit a question of the country where you are treating, where you're treating patient. For me, I would have said Atezobev first, then Stride second. Um, I think Taste Ter plus Dova Bev seeing emerald one the positive note is an interesting option on the other hand we don't know more than has been written in in this 10 lines that we we could read so i think i would start with atezobev plus uh, atezobev seeing varis is great one is a rather low bleeding risk so i think that that would be my preferred option in, the, in this case so Anna, what do you think? I mean, we had we were briefly mentioning Mesh, right? Versus Nash. This has been one of the highlights of Easel and and of the all the societies that we now have a new nomenclature. In fact, last night I was very tired. At eleven o'clock, I was putting Nash into this presentation. I called them today. Please change it to Mesh, or I get in trouble with many important people. Uh, so do you think this is also this Nash discussion for, for Lenva that, or I mean, Lenva is a good therapy option. Why do you think Lenva is here kind of head up with RTPF? Well, to, to be honest, um, I mean, when we talked before, you showed me this question and I said, you know, first decision we have to make is TKI or IO based therapy and usually in patients that I see where they don't, do not have any contraindications for for IO based therapies, um, such as essential organ transplants or autoimmune diseases that are active, um, I would kind of always go with an IO based combination. And only if there are real contraindications, I still choose TKI as first line treatment. So I'm surprised. So for me personally, um, I kind of debated whether it would be a Tezobev or whether it would be Tremade Dova. And I would have expected to be those two options on, on uh, place one and two. Now the audience says Lenva. Um, I guess one has to break a leg for Lenva though too, because we know that also based on the LIBO2 trial, where Lenva was in the control arm, although this was a negative trial, um, Lenva showed that it does have potential as a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, right? So it really showed its activity in clinical use. Nevertheless, in this scenario, um, going with um, cross trial comparisons, of course, but also going um, with quality of life questions where we know that usually the IO based combinations um, retain quality of life for a little bit longer than the TKIs. Um, I think my choices would have been um, a Tazelbev or Tremadova. And I'm not sure whether you were alluding to the etiology discussion that was sometimes a little bit emotional even in, in the last year, I would say. Um, I am actually at this 
point in time not looking into etiology um, in terms of treatment decisions in everyday practice. Thank you. I think there's a there's a strong consensus, right, that etiology should not affect our um, treatment decisions as of today. I mean, it might change in the future. I think we we need to better understand the differences between alcoholic and non-alcoholic uh, related liver disease. Yeah, so I think it's really too early to call, but and as in this case, it's a mixture of both in many cases. Um, but uh, and uh, but I would agree with what, what Anna has said. I mean, lenvatinib is an active treatment, right? So it's uh, it should not be underestimated, and LEAP002 has confirmed that. Um, but in the end, I mean, it's the package, right? I mean, it's not only overall survival, it's it's the combination of response, progression-free survival, overall survival, side effect profile, quality of life. And with that, I think I, I agree with Anna that the IOs are a little bit ahead of the TKIs. Okay. Kiss of, uh, how about sequential therapies, you know? So what, what about the current situation on second line treatments? You know, this was a question, of course, our first line choices, but is there still something like a sequential therapy in real life treatment decisions after first line decisions? Um, is there also room for immunotherapy after immunotherapy? How do we handle this? I mean, all the trials now, most second line trials are after sorafenib and sorafenib is not in this list anymore. I think you are fully right. I mean, if, if you take this patient, we would have started with, with atezobef or stride. I mean, that would have been our options. And then basically, it's very hard to say whether we can do an immunotherapy or not. I mean, we would give, I think, sorafenib, which at least in Germany is the only approved drug for, for this situation to open, uh, let's say, the, the later lines of treatment. So I think if we discuss about sequential treatment, then in this patient, we would continue if we treat outside of clinical studies, we would, we would continue with the TKI. Of course, we have I'm brave uh, 251. That could be a perfect option for this patient. But of course, this is a clinical trial, which would be available only in very few centers. Can you quickly summarize I'm brave 251? What is it doing? Well, let's say to make it very short, it's 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 uh, it's IO beyond progression uh, versus IO not beyond progression. So the TKI, I think this is what is tested in this in this study. But of course, it's study; it's not available for most patients. So I think we would continue continue here with the TKI in the second line. Any input from you guys? Do you think that, for example, ADAs play a role in this? Uh, you know, in also in sequential therapies, Anna. Well, um, we officially don't know yet, um, but I think it's definitely going to be a topic, um, especially because we know that they do exist, um, they can develop, and the percent of, of patients who actually develop ADAs is not that low. We are not 100% sure yet about the functional implications, um, but I think it will become increasingly important to understand the influence of, of ADAs. Um, so because... these are anti-drug antibodies, right? Yes, to, to exactly. Reflect on this. Exactly. So and antibodies especially, develop... yes. Sorry. So and especially um, if we are moving um, immunotherapy in earlier lines, um, in the new adjuvant setting and the adjuvant setting, um, then this issue will even become bigger, right? Because at the time where we start palliative treatment, some patients may have already been exposed to IL-based therapies. And so some of those patients might have already developed this kind of uh, anti-drug antibodies. And we kind of really start, should start trying to understand how they influence um, clinical outcome parameters. That's a very important point. You want to comment on this, on this issue? Anybody? And so otherwise, uh, you know, like we are also hepatologists and liver function is something that is always very important in in clinical practical decision making. Um, is there any signals from if any of these trials here is better or worse for liver function? This is a pretty naive question. And how, for example, you always mention also Albi score versus child score to, to implement it better into therapy, into decisions. What's your take on liver function? Yeah, yeah. so I actually, I don't 
know whether it's a naive question. I think it's a very important question, to be honest, right? And I think this is something we are trying to explore more and more. I think for most of the trials we have now, these post hoc analyses, which looked at the impact of liver function. I mean, the first question is, how does baseline liver function affect outcome? I think we need to be a little bit cautious with that because these are all post hoc analyses. And I mean, what all these, um, what, what what these data have shown clearly and confirmed is that liver function is prognostic. And in general, you can say that, I mean, in the clinical trials, only child QA patients are included. Um, therefore, I always like to refer to the IV score, which is a little bit difficult to, to, to calculate, but it really distinguishes the IB1 and IB2 within the child QI cohort. And we know that even in patients without a tumor, it has an prognostic impact and a survival difference of, of more than 10 years. So this prognostic role is very important. Um, and the question is to which extent does the underlying liver function affects efficacy of the treatment, right? And um, when you look, for example, at IMBRE 150 and uh, Artezo-BEV, it is striking to see that in, in the IB1 group, so those patients with the best well-preserved liver function, we have a tremendous hazard ratio of 0 0.5 and curves are separating widely, while in the IB2 cohort, curves are overlapping. So it does not mean that atezobev is not active, but it's not, in terms of overall survival benefit, not much better than um, serafinib. For, for the other two drugs which were on your list, like lenvatinib and, and, and also for Sprite, interestingly, curves separated also in the IB2 cohort, right? Is that ready for decision-making? Probably not. It's probably too early, but I think it is something we need to monitor in the future. What is the impact of the underlying um, baseline liver function and should we guide our treatment based on liver function? Um, I think we need more data for that. And then the next question is, how does it affect um, outcome? And here, I think we need to, and as you mentioned, we are hepatologists and liver function is not only IB core, also albumin and bilirubin, but also encephalopathy, um, ascites and stuff like that. And, and this is something we definitely need to monitor. And we have, I mean, did some analyses on our own and maybe the risk of decompensation is different with the different treatment. And specifically, patients that are more at risk um, may not tolerate um, bevacizumab, for example, as well as patients that have a well-preserved liver function without cirrhosis or portal hypertension. Yeah. So I think this is something we need to monitor in the future. Um, again, I, I think it's not yet ready for decision-making, but something we, we need to, to monitor and, 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 and keep in, into our mind when we decide for or against either treatment. But I think the good thing is really that, um, I mean, we can start asking these questions, right? Because until recently, we did not really have many options. Now we have options and now we can go into more granular patient subgroups to try to figure out in the future and in the prospective settings, uh, which would be the subgroups that may benefit the most from this or the other treatment. But still the question, I mean, I fully agree, of course. Yeah, I mean, I'm promoting this as well. But the question is to which extent can we take these post hoc analyses for decision making today, right? So I think, I mean, we, we need to look at this. Um, I'm not really sure how we can really address it. There will probably now prospective clinical trials, um, but, but I agree. I mean, it's something we need to keep in, 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 in our mind. Definitely, yes. Um, so we're already in the last five minutes of our discussion and we have already had a great discussion on the kind of Barcelona C or the more advanced patients. Um, you were mentioning already, we're moving with immunotherapy also to earlier earlier stages. Christoph, you mentioned, uh, somebody mentioned Imbrave, one uh, like 050 at AACR presented the adjuvant therapy. It was a positive trial, but is it practice changing or not, Christoph? I think right now, I think it's not not yet 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 ready to be practice changing. I mean, we are lacking real OS data, right? And I mean, if you look to the curves, 
after let's say 18 months, the curve for the control arm, for the experimental arm are overlaying again. So I think we, we are not really sure whether what we see is a delay of recurrence or a prevention of recurrence. And so I think we need more data, we need more mature data, and then we have to see a bit how this study will, will develop. To answer your question, for me at the moment, it's not yet practice changing. It's um, kind of starting to, to, it's challenging us now to, to kind of start thinking in That's other right. dimensions also, right? Yeah. Um, like, for instance, in, in the palliative setting, we, I think we're, we are okay with some adverse events. Um, in an adjuvant setting, um, you have to debate um, whether you can consider some proportion of adverse events as acceptable and where would you draw the line? Where would it be unacceptable concerning the benefit that you have? But of course, I mean, and you already said it, then we are into subgroup analysis again. So um, we have to see what this one try can teach us. Luckily, there will be more adjuvant trials coming. So we may learn more from that. But um, also for me at this time, I, I would say not yet practice changing. Although I have to say, if I, have, if I would have a large HTC, um beyond five centimeters um have been really in the high high risk group um yeah this might be say tempting to to consider at least i think the problem is that we need to define our endpoint right and the trial was powered of recurrence free survival and was a positive trial it was not powered for overall survival the question is is recurrence free survival a valid endpoint yeah and i mean we discussed it in our commentary to the study um Actually, I mean, we would like to see a survival benefit, specifically when we have the risk of side effect. And I fully agree with what, what has been said before. But but this requires that we are more clear on our endpoints. Yeah. And when we say recurrence-free survival is a valid endpoint, and also when you look at the ESMO um, uh, uh, benefit scale, magnitude of benefit scale, it is a reasonable benefit with, with the hazard ratio of, of this trial. So um I think it's, I mean, it's good that we have a positive trial. It paved the way in the right direction. But I think we need to have a discussion now and which basically extends to Emerald One, where we also have obviously a progression-free survival benefit, but not yet an overall survival benefit. The question is, is that acceptable? And I think this is something we will really need to discuss next year when we see more trials. What are really important endpoints? And can we really accept overall survival? I mean, I, I I fully agree with Christoph, and um, it, it's I mean without a survival benefit for an adjuvant treatment, I mean it, it, I mean it's disappointing. But still, I mean, is it something we need to implement in clinical practice? I think I mean, if it's approved, we we probably would consider it, right? I'm not sure whether it will be approved with these data, but if I I fully agree with Anna in really high right risk patients, if it would be approved, of course, would do it. Yeah. And if this patient is you treat for two years or for one year, and then tumor comes back, go back to immunotherapy or what? When there is the recurrence, six months after after the, the study or after the treatment, one year, eight I think months. this is a bit the eight question, months. Eight, eight months. I don't know, maybe after eight months, well, these... I would reconsider immunotherapy, I guess. After eight months, I would be willing to think about it. No, but it I would say we, we, we don't know yet, right? I mean, no, I think, we don't know um, yet. Yeah, Tries like uh, I'm Brave 251, because if you mentioned it, yeah. um, they will teach us at least some initial lessons concerning mm. I.O. beyond progression. Mm. So this will be important to see. And I think there will be more trials to follow. Are definitely mm. important issue, but it will not make things easier for us in deciding on the best sequential mm. treatments. Great, thank you very much. So um, maybe in the end, some more general questions for our audience. And what do we expect for 2024? What trial data you think might be practice changing that we can expect in the next months? So, so I think 2024 can be really practice changing. I think it can be really the year where we have a tremendous impact on how we treat HTC in the future. Yeah, so Emerald One will be the first study, and we will see how this reads out, right? Maybe we see some of can, the other Can you studies. briefly again mention Emerald One for everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a study where we basically evaluate the efficacy of checkpoint inhibitors 
in combination with TACE in intermediate stage HCC. Yeah? And the study is positive, so we saw an increase or an improvement in progression-free survival. We do not yet know about overall survival. But I think what we are now need to think about and what we aim for is that we bring patients to local therapies, to surgery, to transplantation, to a tumor-free state. Yeah? And I think when we really combine all the strategies we have in intermediate state, we can have we can we can maybe make really a tremendous impact yeah and maybe a, a case as we started with yeah which we would not consider for local therapies today maybe we will consider next year for a combination of taste plus checkpoint inhibitors we already have some data that local therapies might help even in bclcc patients so i think um for me i think 2024 can be or has the potential to be a really a practice changing year and I, I think it will start off with ASCO GI and Emerald One. Hopefully, we will see more patients, um, but it could be a really, really interesting year. Great. And so maybe today, in a year, we can meet back in this group and, and reflect we have to. and see if you were <laughs> right, okay? Yes, we have to. <laughs> Anna, last question to you, Anna. So ESOL is, as you said, you're supporting, we're supporting the the, the liver cancer. And and yet, it is not that at the ESOL meeting we are seeing the big trial data yet. You know, we see them at ASCO, we see them at um, ESMO. What can we do to also <laughs> push it uh, towards ESOL? Because I mean, liver cancer is has become, I think we all agree, one of the most dynamic, one of the most interesting interdisciplinary fields for hepatology. Yeah, I say I think um is I mean I, I'm part of it since many years, so um has a lot of strength. We do have the uh, is a liver cancer summit, uh, which is a meeting especially dedicated to liver cancer, uh, both clinical and research. And that is we are trying also to really unite um, basic research and clinical research, which I think is exceptionally important. Um, also, I mean, Art is very optimistic about 2024. 20, I would say I, I'm, I'm the bad copy. I would say we have more questions than answers um, by this time next year, to be honest. So I think we need basic research to really bring some some light into the dark here. And I think this is what, what ESA is also supporting. And I think this needs to go hand in hand. We need to work with industry. We need to work with basic science. And we need to work with clinical scientists. And this is what ESA is here for. Perfect. So we're looking forward to Milano to see all your colleagues in Milano. Everybody in this round will also be there. You can discuss with the experts and reflect on the data from that we have seen by then. So with this, dear colleagues, I would like to close in the name of the whole audience. We wish you all a good Christmas time. Next Wednesday, please connect again to the ESOL studio to explore the diagnosis and assessment of hepatic encephalopathy, which will be treated with a patient-centric perspective. Very interesting, so please join that session. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, Arndt. Thank you very much, Christoph. And for everybody who joined us live or who listens to us after this meeting, you can find it on the ESOL homepage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Bye. Bye-bye.